who's the face of guitar, period. I don't think anybody's had as much an influence. I know this is probably a cliche, but since Jimi Hendrix, it was like every kid on the block was learning Van Halen licks. It was ridiculous. And uh, as far as for me, it was in between all the technical prowess that, that Eddie had, there was a killer blues thing, which nobody, everybody that emulated it, but nobody ever got it. Nobody ever got that part. They had the, the hammer-ons, they had the tremolo bar stuff, and all that kind of crap. But they, they never got the most important thing was all the really tasty stuff that was in between. And just yeah. like some of the, the melodic stuff where the soul was coming from. Yeah. And so everybody in town had to learn how to play like Van Halen for eons after that. And yeah. that's just the way it was. So, I mean, he contributed a lot, but you really have to get into um, every record and every solo and just start making because there's a little statement there and everything. Um, I just think all around it was a uh, shot in the arm for guitar. It was just beyond mind blowing. I mean, you know, just hearing like going, and especially the tap. I, I go, that, that can't be a guitar. What is that? You know, and then, you know, now you know, and you hear the phase ninety on it now, and you know, the the effects and the, the delay and the and, and everything, just the whole nine yards. It was just like beyond mind blowing. It sounded like nothing I'd ever heard before. Um, it sounded like aliens or something coming out of that room, and I thought it was the best thing I'd ever heard in my life. I think sound is as important as if you want it to be reproduced to enhance what you're playing, you know, it has to sound a certain way. There's a time and a place for a clean sound and everything. I use many different sounds, but over the top, it's definitely got to got to go to 12, so to speak. I like it to sound like it's basically dying and then back it off a tad. Right. You know? On the brink of Yeah. Of no, I've pretty much been known to push everything past the limit. For sure. And back it off a little bit, you know? It's it's kinda like a finely tuned race car, you know? They push everything to the limit. It's got a scream. Uh Mean Street off of Fair Warning, just because I think that riff is like so signature and so memorable and so dark and rowdy at the same time and it's just that was one of the first you know riffs that made me want to play guitar I wanted to figure out how to make something sound like that and how to make a you know make it growl like that one does <laughs> Probably the only one back then that would just take everything on the amp and turn it full, full blast up. I remember when we played clubs because, you know, I had that approach to my playing since about 74, you know, uh, with the old amps I used to use. I'd turn them all the way up. People would tell me, you can't use them like that. I go, really? Watch this. You know, there are little tricks that I did to keep it from blowing, but, uh, you know, all kinds of guitars used to come in snoop around and see what the hell I was doing. But it was pretty basic, really. It was just turn all the way up. I still don't think people really do it the same way I do. 
you know, because I never ever used a stomp box to boost the signal. I never had a distortion pedal or anything. I always got, you know, the, the sound starts in your fingers, you know? So obviously I had to build my own guitar to convey what I was playing, and from there out of the cable into an amp head that would convey what the guitar is sending out, <laughs> you know? So it's really kind of a chain thing. Yeah. You know? But bottom line, it starts with your ear. You know, if you had no concept of tone, then, you know, out comes bleh. As far as rock guitar goes, uh, to me, it's just Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy, Jimmy Page, and then Eddie. You, you know what I mean? And I mean, when Eddie came out, it was just bam. You know I mean? Just like, he didn't knock the door down. He just completely destroyed it. <laughs> even researched back then was the actual grill cloth of an amp, you know? Because I, I used to like the thicker stuff because it would take some of the high end out. Yeah, you know? it rolls off. Yeah, in the old club days, I used to take that uh, stuff that you tack on the wall in the recording studio, that, that, uh, that egg carton egg kind of uh, foam yeah. stuff. I used to have a, a slab of that and I'd, I would duct tape it to the front of my cabinet because I felt bad for, for the people sitting right down Front, you know, sitting there sipping their loud. their uh, little mai tai or whatever the hell with the cabinet sitting about three feet away from their head. Yeah, sounds kind to them. I think it has to sound warm and sustainy. So along comes Ed Van Halen, uh, and puts his hands on a guitar and absolutely transforms it into something that no one knew you could do it that way. I remember the first time I ever heard Van Halen. I must have been 15 or 16 in high school and uh, it just blew me away, man. It floored me. I'd never heard anything like it in my entire life. And uh, me and Diamond just started playing, and uh, it was in the early stages of Pantera, and uh, Van Halen was a huge influence on us. In particular, Eddie and Alex, you know, they were just uh, kind of what me and Don mirrored ourselves after. And uh, I just remember there was so much excitement, uh, exuberance, uh, vibrance in the music, and then of course they had their own very unique sound that no one else had at the time. And uh, it really motivated me and my brother to play music and I'll never forget it. It was a very important time in my life. I mean, Eddie's just a super creative guy, so I mean, the bottom line is the side of the plane. What I learned from this experience was um, basically how Ed got his sound and how much the amplifier really did play a role in that. And I was a little bit surprised by that. I mean, I had you know, known about how he had gone about things just by Beautiful. what I had read, mm -hmm. you know, being informed, things like that, but I had no idea how much of the impact. And uh, so that was probably the, the biggest thing I took out of this experience as cool. far as approaching amplifier design. Like I said earlier, it's very difficult to explain tone to someone. And once you joined the team, I think after two weeks, he had something that was much closer. It was a breakthrough. But the most important part of an amp to me are the transformers. The transformer was the key. Yeah, was. That's a proprietary uh, transformer to the 5153. Yes. It's not available anywhere else. You can't yeah. buy it and stick it in another right. amp. So That's uh, correct. Well, I, I like a guitar amp to thump, you know? Yeah. So, so it breathes, you know, which is a bit of compression 
and this and that, you know, then that's sustain. You know, when you stand close to a cabinet, it's actually pushing air. Yes. It's not like chucking razor blades at you. It's not hard. That was another thing that I learned quite a bit from Ed was the, the sustain. Mm -hmm. Sustain was the, big, yeah. was the big key to your sound. And, uh, you know, so that definitely gave direction as far as how to shape the preamp. It's, it's like it doesn't hit you down here or up here, you know, it's kind of in the chest. You know, you can yeah, feel you can it and vibrate it, yeah. One of the things that I still to this day don't know how he achieved it, but how rapid fire, the channel speed. switching yeah. works because every other amp, you know, that I've been involved with building, you know, you always got to, it's kind of like punching in when you're overdubbing. It's like one, two, three, you got to... It's like a hiccup. Yeah, you have to uh, anticipate where to hit that switch so you don't hear the actual mechanical switching of it. Right. This thing, you know, it's right on the money. It's definitely a design completely a different way than yeah. other foot switch designs that I have done in the past. So you took some chances on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it wound up wound up on the good side. Right? Yes, my man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta take chances. Yeah. Taking a, a guitar and turning the amp full up and laying it down in front of the cabinet and just letting it scream. You know, I think everyone at Fender was blown away because when they left. I think if, if you remember, I put a guitar down by the mm -hmm. cabinet. I remember it. And, and turned the amp all the way up and just waited for it to feed back. I said, okay, let's go. And we're halfway out the studio and he was looking at me like, aren't you gonna turn the amp off? And I said, no, that's how I crash test my stuff. And they came back a month later and the amp was still on. <laughs> <laughs> and without blowing. So it can sustain for a month. Yeah, continue. I think we did that three times. Yeah. You know? Every time we made a change, okay, come back in a month, let's see if it holds up. We literally dragged this thing to hell and back and it would not blow up. I'm proud of that. I'm, I'm proud of Mike for building a brick shit house that just would not blow up. Just like transformers and so many other things in the amp, the Celestion 12 inch speaker is unique to 5150. I've been a tone chaser all my life and this is the ultimate amp. It's a culmination of everything I've ever done. You don't have to make the music I make in order to uh, enjoy a 5153. It'll blow your mind on any setting.